recording. All right. Now, um, I just need to make a quick statement here. Uh, we're interviewing uh, Howard J. Lasker at Latham headquarters. It is uh, July 17, 2001. Interviewer is Michael Akey. Videographer is uh, Wayne Clark. Uh, Mr. Lasker, where, where'd you grow up? Where did I grow up? In Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, New York. I'm a Brooklynite. Mm -hmm. Came up to Albany to work for the state back in 1940, uh, 1940. Okay. and I met my wife at that time, and we were married uh, while I was in service. I was stationed in Florida at the time. She came down to Florida, and we were married there. Did you enlist? Or you no, I was drafted for one year. Back in those days, I was drafted before the war in March of uh, 40, mm -hmm. and you were drafted for one year at that time, and 12 months you would uh, be discharged. Sep uh, December 7th came along, and the whole deal was canceled. <laughs> Where uh, where'd you do your basic? Where did I do my basic? I did my basic in infantry. I was drafted for one year, and I did it at Camp Wheeler mm -hmm. in Georgia. Uh, and I, I was a college graduate, and they took all of the um, college graduates and put them in one pl platoon. Uh, they called it the intelligence platoon. When December 7th came around, they transferred the intelligence platoon into the signal corps. We were transferred out of the infantry, and uh, we set up uh, the air warning service uh, along the east coast. There were some of our people went to England, studied uh, their air defense system, while the rest of us, uh, uh, we were at Drew Field. We set up Drew Field that didn't exist at that time. We built Drew Field, and we all were trained in air warning service, and we were assigned up and down the coast uh, in the air warning service. And so I did that as an enlisted man. I was assigned to Tampa, and I was in Tampa uh, doing this, and uh, I was content to stay in Tampa because we uh, lived in the city, we were on rations and quarters, we were housed in the Floridan Hotel in Tampa, and we worked an eight-hour shift and then you were free. And you could do anything you wanted, go anywhere you wanted. We, with our thumb, traveled all over uh, the, the coast down there. Now, you established this warning system. In uh, the U.S. What exactly was it? Same thing. We had air, uh, ground observers mm -hmm. uh, with telephones all up and down the coast. And if any planes flew overhead, uh, the ground observers would call them into our headquarters mm -hmm. and say planes are flying overhead. And we had the flight plans of every plane that took off from the field at that time. We knew every plane that was in the air. Mm -hmm. And if one was in the air that we didn't know about, we would send up a, p a plane to investigate who are they. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had that same system with ground observers. They were pulled right in, and all the people that were in our outfit, uh, other than we, uh, fighter control squadron is base, uh, has two different groups of people. Those who do the plotting and uh, what have you on the board make the decisions, and those who run the telephone lines and take care of uh, all the communications. So the communications people were brought right in from Southern Bell Telephone. And uh, our commanding officer was an executive at Southern Bell. He was just brought in, given a captaincy. He became the captain of the outfit and never been in the military, and he ran all of the, his people, his linemen who ran up and down the poles with telephones and what have you, mm -hmm. and they uh, gave us the information. And I was in the group of uh, plotters. We plotted the stuff on the play, uh, on the, on a map. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an enlisted man, uh, we just put the little dots on the map. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the officers who made the decision uh, to send up our planes and give them instructions. How long were you in Florida? And so I was in Florida for uh, one year from uh, 19, I was there right, at, uh, we were sent there right after war broke out on the December 7th. Mm -hmm. We were sent there on December 14th. Yeah. We were in December 14th, we were all being loaded on uh, trains, and we said, oh my God, we're going overseas already. Uh, war had just broken out, and we felt right away. But instead we got off the, uh, the uh, trains in Tampa, Florida, and we were there for a year. Uh, I was content to stay there. I mean, this life living in a hotel, uh, getting uh, food money, and eating any restaurant you wanted, uh, it was a, a great life. And I think I would have stayed there forever if I could have. But at the end of one year, we, 
There were three uh, information centers in Florida, uh, Miami, Tampa, and Jacksonville. And we heard that Tampa and Miami were being closed and all of Florida was going to be controlled from Jacksonville. So when I heard that and that we were going to be shipped over to North Africa, they said, well, it's time to stop being an enlisted man. And I uh, applied for officer's training school. And I wanted to go in the Air Corps school. And they said, that's impossible. The only one that's open is infantry, said uh, OCS. And I said, I don't want to be an infantry lieutenant. Uh, I think you could understand why. Mm -hmm. I said, I want to be an Air Corps uh, uh, officer. And they said, that's impossible. But on my application, two things. Number one, I put down that I, had been, uh, that I was an Eagle Scout. And I don't know if that influenced them, that I was, uh, I'd been in Boy Scouting all my life. I joined when I was 12, became a Scoutmaster when I be uh, assistant when I was 18 and so on. And uh, I was in Scouting and as an Eagle Scout. So I don't know if that influenced them or the fact that I did have uh, an Army IQ of what uh, this sounds like bragging, but it really isn't, that uh, they consider genius level. Anything over 140, they considered uh, genius level. Mm -hmm. And my IQ was uh, well over 140. And uh, so I don't know if that was why, but they did accept me at Air Corps OCS. I became an Air Corps officer. And when you become an officer at OCS, when you finish, then you have to apply for a particular school. And I applied for uh, Harvard. Uh, statistical uh, officer school mm -hmm. because this is what I was doing for the state. I was working for the Bureau of Research and Statistics of the Department of Labor. And I said if I get some a few years of experience as a statistician with the Army, I'll be able, eligible to take an, an advanced test when I come back for a high uh, rating in the state service. Mm -hmm. So I applied for a statistical officer school and my roommate saw me and he said, where are you applying? I told him. He said, what are statistics? I told him. He said, I'll apply also. I don't need to give you the punchline on this story. He was accepted because he knew nothing about statistics. I was sent off to air warning school because of my basic, my training as an enlisted man. So I became an air uh, warning officer. And he went off. The, I guess it was easier to teach somebody in the Army way to do statistics from scratch rather than t taking somebody who was a statistician and retraining them the army way over what you, the way you did it as a, st as a civilian. So I went into the air warning service. What was your first assignment out of the air warning service? Uh, my first assignment was to the 305th Fighter Control Squadron, and that was in Blackstone Army Air Base. And from there, we were, we were transferred to Galveston Army Air Base, and that was supposed to be a permanent duty station. We were training the Second Air Force how to uh, fly under the control of uh, an air, for, uh, air warning service officer. And they were right. The uh, 305th did become permanent there, but the officers <laughs> didn't become. They didn't say we were we, we were transferred out to the uh, 317th in uh, March Field in California, Riverside, California. Mm -hmm. And from there, we were sent overseas. We went from there back to Virginia, to Hampton Roads, and we took a boat from there to Algeria, Oran, we went across North Africa, uh, through the Suez Canal, up to India, to Bombay, took a train across Bom from Bombay to Calcutta. From Calcutta, we were flown up to Burma, from Burma, we were flown up into China, and there we were uh, received our uh, 14th Air Force assignments. Uh, there were 14 uh, officers uh, that were sent, 14 uh, air warning officers, 14 fighter controllers. And so we arrived in Chengdu, and uh, we would get off the plane, Hank Greenberg, I'm sure you know the name, baseball player, mm -hmm. Hall of Famer. He's there, he was the public relations officer there, and he personally greeted everybody as we got, all 14 of us as we got off the plane. What was your first impression of China? My first impression of China? The Chinese were wonderful people. They were friendly, they were, couldn't do enough for Americans. Everything about American was great. They copied everything we did. Uh, they couldn't do enough for us. Uh, but where we were, 
They needed food. Food was uh, so desperate. We are uh, in tents, and around between the tents, they had little rice paddies. We had to walk on a little path between the rice paddies to get to the tents. They were growing rice in every square foot of ground in that area in Chengdu. Uh, it was amazing how they didn't waste a foot of uh, ground where they could grow food because they could not feed all the people. At that time, now they got a billion people, then it was multi-millions, and they just couldn't feed them all. Uh, it was pitiful to see some of the starving people in the cities. Uh, India too couldn't feed them all. Uh, you'd see a corpse laying at the curb or so that died of starvation during the night laying there. And the, uh, it's, we cannot visualize the situation uh, that was over there at that time. And so we were in Chengdu, and I'd possibly like to know how I ended up in commanding the CN uh, outfit. Uh, the, uh, so the, the 14th Air Force was in, stationed in China? Yes. The uh, 14th Air Force was created in China. Created Only in China. one of two Air Forces that was created outside the uh, continental limits of the U.S. Uh, this came about because when you talk about the Flying Tigers, the Flying Tigers actually were three separate uh, divisions. In, uh, in when, the, uh, when the Japanese invaded China, and the Chinese could not stop them at all. Uh, the Japanese had a modern air force, the Chinese had nothing. And I won't go into how they arrived at uh, getting Chenault there to, uh, take, to organize their air force, but he eventually became the commander of their, air, uh, their fledgling air force. He, they made him a colonel in the uh, Chinese army, and he was uh, setting it up. And he was setting it up uh, in Nanking. And the Japanese invaded China. Uh, they invaded it at Peking up at the uh, there, uh, and then they came down and they uh, raided. Uh, well, you, I'm sure, read the book, uh, the Rape of Nanking, or so. The, the Japanese, with their air force, destroyed the eighth and ninth armies of the Chinese. They were the best two divisions in the uh, Chiang Kai-shek's army and they were destroyed, and the remnants of them fled to Nanking, and the Japanese came in and just wiped out Nanking. They killed everybody, women, children, men, and uh, Chenault uh, moved his uh, fledgling air force that he was training to Kunming. The Chinese moved back uh, to Chongqing for their headquarters, and uh, they saw how desperate uh, they needed a, a modern air force. And so uh, Chiang Kai-shek sent his brother-in-law, T.V. Sung, that was Madame Chang's brother, to the U.S. to speak to uh, President Roosevelt, who permitted any flyer. Uh, we did not have an Air Force per se in the U.S. We had the Army Air Force, the Navy Air Force, the Marine Air Force. He permitted any Air Force officer to resign their commissions if they signed up for the Chinese Air Force. And I think there was a total of 85 pilots uh, resigned their commissions and joined the Chinese Air Force. And they came over to China, and the Chinese at that time had purchased a total of 43 P-40s. So the, they formed the, what was known as the AVG, the American Volunteer Group. 85 pilots, 43 planes. and. Uh, uh, Chenault organized them into three squadrons. He kept two squadrons in uh, Kunming, and he sent one squadron down to Rangoon to uh, fly with the British against the Japanese who were coming uh, in, in the south. And uh, the first the time that the Japanese invaded uh, Rangoon, when the AVG was there, they came in and uh, well, the, the first in the flight, the first time they came in, it was on De December, beginning of December, no, middle of December, and uh, they came in with a flight of 20 planes, and uh, the AVG uh, knocked down 
12 of them and lost four of their planes. Uh, two days later, the Japanese sent in a flight of 80 bombers and 20 fighters. Can you visualize the, the Armada that came in? The AVG put up two, uh, two flights of their planes. They shot down 20 Japanese planes without losing a single plane. These are figures that I know when they came back and were printed in the papers here, people must have said this was a public relations man dream. It could not have been. They could not have shot down 20 Japanese planes without losing one. But it was fact. And uh, uh, all my statistics are not up there, so I brought a little piece of paper with some statistics. And uh, in the period of the AVG, they shot down 452 Japanese planes, losing only 12 U.S. planes. Can you visualize 452 Japanese planes with the loss of 12? Well, they only had 43 to start, but they couldn't <laughs> lose many more and still uh, have existed. And so that was uh, the AVG. So uh, you came in in country about when? Well, I'll get to that if, if you can. Sure. Uh, let me continue the sequence here. The first, so when the war broke out in 19, and December 7th, uh, these, the AVG were brought into the US, back into the U.S. Air Force, and they became what was known as the CATF, uh, Combined Allied Task Force. Some people refer to it as the Chinese-American Task Force because there were our planes, but they had Japanese, uh, Chinese flyers flying with them. And the, uh, this, I've got the dates because I can't remember all these dates. Uh, the CAT f was formed in July 1942, and they lasted for nine months until March 1943. March 43, uh, up until this point, the CATF and the AVG were under the control of, uh, of the CBI theater. Uh, the commanding officer of the American forces was General Stilwell. General Stilwell felt the war was going to be won on the ground and was building the Burma Road and the Lido Road, and he said, with our tanks, we're going to win the war. Uh, Schnault, uh up in China was saying, no, the war's going to be won in the air. He wanted the gas and oil. Still uh, was keeping it down there for his tanks and his trucks. So uh, Schnault appealed to uh, President Roosevelt, and it was in uh, 1943 that the 14th Air Force was born in China. When it was born in China in March 1943, he immediately ordered 14 uh, fighter controllers to sign throughout uh, China to work with his uh, with the 14th Air Force, and it was at that point that I was sent over, that our group was sent over uh, to work with China. So that was in 1943 that we arrived in China, and we all arrived in Chengdu, and we're sitting there, 14 of us. Uh, there wasn't enough work for 14 of us. I mean, you figure if you work an eight-hour shift. Uh, how infrequently you got to be a controller with 14 of us taking turns. So some of us, uh, some of the people who became censors and some of them became uh, all sorts of other odd jobs there. I was one of, happened to remain one of the controllers and I was on duty the night where everything was a secret. We didn't know that we were going to get uh, B-29s coming through to bomb uh, the Japanese up in Manchuria except we saw all of a sudden 10,000 Chinese uh, laborers out on the airfield. Women were coming in, uh, men were coming in with a pole over their shoulder with baskets of stones on either end of the pole, dumping them on the uh, th uh, runway. And women were sitting there pounding them into, and they were extending the runways. Why were they extending the runways? Because we were going to get the B-29s coming in, and we needed longer runways for them than we needed for uh, our planes. So we weren't told what was happening, but we, the, everybody knew what was going what was happening. The Japanese knew something was happening too, and so they sent in this, uh, one night or an air raid of Japanese planes over our field to bomb the, the field. I happened to be the controller on duty that night, 
and I'm sitting there and I'm getting the plots, the Japanese planes are coming in, I know they're coming in, and uh, everybody in the building knew they were coming in, and we were in, there was a colonel in charge of the operation, and he's running around the building, where's my helmet, where's my helmet? Now we were in a building that was revetted with sandbags, and if bombs dropped on the field, we were protected, the shrapnels who could not have hurt us. If there was a direct bomb right on our building, the helmet uh, wasn't going to help very much. And so he's running around, and I'm the controller on duty. I know we have to get our planes up in the air. He doesn't give me any orders. He's nowhere to be found. So I sent up, on my own initiative, our planes are in the air. The Japanese came in. Our planes were up there, and they diverted the Japanese attack. They dropped their bombs. Not a single bomb landed on our field. And uh, the Japanese turned around and went away. We didn't shoot down any of their planes, but none of our planes were destroyed on the field. The next morning, that colonel came over to me, and he said, last night, he said, you saved my butt. He says, I owe you something. What does this mean? A colonel saying to me, I was a first lieutenant at the time. I owe you. Didn't mean anything to me. But a few weeks later, he came to me, and he said, we're going to open up a squadron up in the Yellow River at Xi'an. And he said, if you want to be command, uh, the command of the outfit, he says, it's yours. Now, uh, he gave me that choice because we're here in Chengdu, which is 400 miles away from the nearest Japanese airfield. Xi'an uh, airfield was in the south side of the Yellow River. The Japanese had an airfield on the north side of the Yellow River. We were, we were about 20 miles away from the Japanese. Now, you have to be out of your mind to go from 400 miles away to 20 miles away. But when you're 25 years old and you're gung-ho, uh, you don't even think about those things. I was going to become the commanding officer of this unit. I was going to become a captain. This was great. And so I accepted it, and I'd go up to CN and uh, open up the uh, base up there. What was living like there? Uh, when we went up there, we were living in tents at the time. Uh, it was, uh, Cien has some of the latitude, uh, basically, of New York. Mm -hmm. And so it was the same temperature that we have here. Uh, warm summers could be very hot summers. Cold winters could be very cold winters. Where Chengdu was in a tropical area, it was hot and uh, humid, and uh, it was strictly, as I say, a tropic uh, climate. And, uh, but one of the reasons I wanted to get up there, too, was the uh, Chengdu was the headquarters for the 312th Fighter Wing, the 311th Fighter Group, and uh, all the generals and all the brass was there, and we all had pressed uniforms, creases in our shirts, shine shoes, and a lot of saluting and stuff. Going up there, no generals, no brass. Uh, I was going to be on my own in charge of my unit, working with uh, a squadron of planes. Uh, so that was another reason why uh, CN looked so appetizing mm -hmm. uh, for me. So we got up there, and uh, the very first week or so that we were up there, the Japanese bombed uh, the hell out of our <laughs> installation and knocked me off the air and, uh, and everything. But uh, that's another, another story. Uh, uh, I don't know where, how much of this you want me to tell you now, or you want me to, because when we were up there, uh, I was sent up to my outfit again. Half of them were, con uh, were controller people. I, my office was in an old German uh, bomb shelter, down eight feet below the ground in a brick bomb shelter that the Germans, I don't know what period of time they were there, had built this. The um, hangar for the the uh, squadron of planes was all bombed out, the roof was gone, and what have you. And uh, we were sent, the, uh, one month at a time, one squadron of planes from the uh, 311th uh, fighter group. And the 311th consisted of three squadrons of planes, the 528th, 529th, and 530th. They were under the control of Colonel John Chenault, son of Claire Chenault. Mm -hmm. And John Schnault was up at the base with the planes, and Claire Schnault, his father, visited us at the base every month to visit his son. Mm -hmm. And I, met, I would meet with the general every month. He, when he came up there, he'd come down to see my operation. And I had all of the respect in the world for this guy because 
any lesser general would have come down and to show that he was boss, he'd say, why don't you do it this way, why don't you do something that way? He'd come down, he says, I like what I see, and he'd walk out. He never once told me to do something his way. He said, I like what I see, and that was it. He never corrected anything uh, that I did there. And uh, uh, we set up our operations. I say I had this uh, Lieutenant uh, Wong from the the Chinese Air Force as my interpreter. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked with the ground observers. I had a topographic map there, and uh, it was underneath a plastic, and I would make plots over it as the calls would come in to me from the various observers, and I would decide what the target was going to be, and I'd call over to the squadron of planes and put our planes up. One squadron I, uh, consists of four flights. There were 16 planes to a squadron four flights of four planes each. So at all, uh, the most I ever had was 16 fighters. But when the 14th Air Force was born, instead of the P-40s, they brought in P-51s for them. So at this point, I was controlling P-51s, not P-40s. And I had uh, two P-47s to use as night fighters. The P-51, the spinner out front, uh, there's a little flame that comes out from the spinner around be, uh, the, behind the propeller. So during the day, this is okay. You couldn't use them for the night fighting because the flame in front of them, they couldn't see in front of them. The P-47, the flame came out beneath the plane, and we could use them as night fighters. So I used the P-47s as night fighters uh, for, the, for the first six months until they sent in... Uh, some P-61s. P-61s was a night fighter plane. I don't know if you've ever heard of the P-61. If you say you haven't, I can understand this because in 1981 we had a reunion of our 14th Air Force Association in Atlanta, Georgia, which at that time was the headquarters of the current 14th Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I went in to see General McAdoo, who was the commanding general of the 14th Air Force at that time, and his aide was a major. And I was telling him the same story that I'm telling you. And he, the A looks at me, P-61s? They never heard of it. What was the P-61? And this is a, was a current major in the Air Force at that time. P-61 was called uh, the Black Widow. It was a twin fuselage uh, plane, and it had a radar operator and a radar in the rear of the plane. Uh, and so the pilot is sitting up here, the radar operator is sitting in the back of the plane, and with the radar, they could see in front of them without seeing anything. So they, it was a perfect night fighter. And, uh, How often did you use night fighters? In the beginning, we used them when there were Japanese planes coming in. But uh, we were up there, oh, I don't, uh, not more than four or five months when we drove every Japanese plane out of our area. Because during the day, when there were no raids coming in, I sent our planes up the railroad. There was one railroad that came in that supplied the Japanese. And I sent our planes up, and we uh, hit any engine that we saw uh, bringing supplies in. And uh, with the engines were in the repair shops all during the war. They never could bring supplies in. We knocked them out as fast as they brought a plane, uh, it's an engine in. And uh, without supplies, the Japanese couldn't exist where they were, and they had to pull back. So after six months or so, there wasn't a Japanese plane anywhere in our area, and we had to send our planes out uh, looking for them mm -hmm. and uh, shooting up the railroads. And uh, so we didn't need uh, night fighters uh, after six months. We had no Japanese plane raids coming in at night, mm -hmm. and uh, so I used them too, flying up the railroads, shooting up the planes. As a matter of fact, uh, off the record, uh, I flew in uh, with them in these. The wing, the, uh, the wheels came up behind the pilot's seat, and there was a hump where the wheels came up. And I would fly out. I'd sit on the hump behind the pilot, looking over his shoulder. Now, all these things, you're 26 years old at that time, 25 years old. You, you don't have many brains. Uh, the thrill, the excitement of flying out and shooting up uh, train. This was exciting. This was much better than sitting behind a map and looking at it all day long. And so I would fly out with them, sitting on this hump, 
pilot had a parachute, the uh, radar operator had a parachute. I never had a parachute on. <laughs> uh, with no Japanese planes, I wasn't worried that anything was going to happen to us. And so I would fly out. But uh, 50 years later, I think back, uh, you weren't so bright <laughs> in those days. So but how, living with, how was living, uh, how were living conditions? Uh, the entire time that I was there, I lived down in the bomb shelter. I had a cot down there, and two of my enlisted men had cots down there, and the three of us stayed in the bomb shelter 24 hours a day. Uh, my enlisted men were living in tents up above, and after, uh, I lose track of how many months it was, they, there was a, a Chinese convent or something nearby, and they were able to move into that and they lived uh, in the buildings after a while. We had a mess hall, we, uh, we all ate in a mess hall. Uh, Chinese, uh, it was reverse lend lease, Chinese supplied us with the food and cooks. They cooked our food and uh, fed us Chinese food, not like you get in the Chinese restaurants. Yeah, uh, but something people think that I lived on rice for uh, the entire time. Up there, that's not so. As I said, it was the uh, same latitude as New York. It's a wheat belt. They grew wheat, and uh, the staple up there was noodles. Everything was noodles. In Chengdu, in the southern end, everything was rice. You had rice dishes. But we had noodles up there, and pigs and chickens. There was no beef. There was no cows. They, they had no cows in China. And uh, so uh, lunch, uh, breakfast was always eggs and bacon, eggs and ham. Uh, lunch was always pork or chicken, and dinner was the reverse, chicken or pork. So for, uh, I'm a good Jewish boy, and for uh, two years I lived on pork. Uh, but before we went overseas, we were addressed by a rabbi, and he didn't know where we were gonna go. He says, you may up end up in a place where the only thing you're gonna be, have to eat is pork. He says, the good Lord will forgive you, eat pork. And so for, for the, the whole period of time uh, that we were there, we lived on, uh, we had no milk. Uh, they sent in from the powdered milk from the States, and uh, they sent in coffee. But the uh, Chinese never did learn how to make a cup of coffee. It was really r rough coffee that we had for that period. Your relations were with the Chinese were fairly good? Oh, yes, yes. As I say, they loved us. We couldn't do anything wrong. Everything we did was perfect. Uh, they would, they m manufactured soap. Now, I don't know if you remember in those days, palm olive soap was in with a green wrapper with a black band around. The Chinese manufactured soap. It was in a green paper wrapper with a black band around it with a gold seal uh, on the black wrapper. Anything we did, they copied. Uh, anything we did was perfect. Nothing we did. I said it could be wrong. Did you deal with the Chinese army and Air Force? Uh, our guards were uh, Chinese. We had no uh, U.S. infantry there. All the infantry was Chinese. So we had a company of Chinese uh, soldiers uh, as guards at our uh, base. And my instructions were that if I saw the Japanese coming across the river, don't depend upon that Chinese company to stop them. Evacuate. So my instructions were to evacuate because if the Japanese started coming, 10 feet in front of us would be the Chinese infantry <laughs> running. So we'd have, those were our instructions. Don't depend upon them. But uh, we had Chinese uh, guards. Uh, now you mentioned earlier before we started rolling the, tactic, uh, the tactics here, uh, the P-40s yeah. versus the Zeros. Did you go over that? Uh, well, it was with all of our planes, the P-51s as well. Uh, the Zero was lighter and more maneuverable than our planes. Our planes were heavier, uh, more armament, uh, sturdier, could mm, resist uh, uh, getting shot, uh, some bullet holes in it, much better than the Japanese planes. They were so light and flimsy. And uh, so, uh, again, as I say, our, the instructions were, uh, they are more maneuverable than our planes. Uh, make your pass, dive, make another pass. And those instructions uh, followed the entire time. 
and they were so successful. The total, I have a total for you. During the war from 1941 to 1945, the Japanese lost 2,504 planes. These are actual statistics from the War Department and in the air and 1,895 on the ground for a total of 4,399 planes lost. We lost 117 planes in the air and 76 destroyed on the ground for a total of 193. That's a total, an average, of 22 to 1. We destroyed 22. It's a record that will never be equaled by any other air force anywhere in the world. 22 to 1. Now, how long were you posted up at this? Uh, till the end of the war. To the end of the war? Oh, yeah. I was there. Uh, it was there till the end of the war. And when the war ended, uh, we couldn't wait to get out. And so uh, the, we received orders to go. But uh, our outfit was sent back through uh, the way we came to Calcutta mm -hmm. and reversed uh, the way we arrived there. I was, had been a captain up there for a year and a half or a year, and uh, that's because the table of organization called for captain to be the commanding officer of this. And they said, you've been a captain uh, long enough, you should, have been a, you should be a major. If you sign up for six months duty in in Shanghai as a processing officer, processing everybody on the way home, will give you a majority. I said, I'm just as eager to get home as my enlisted men. I said, no, I'm on my way. So I never did become a major. I, and when I got back to Fort Dix in the United States, I was given the same uh, thing. They looked at my record and they said, you should be a major. Uh, stay here for six months, processing the people as they come through, will give you a majority. I said, no way, I want to get home, I'm married, I want to get my family started, I want to get my uh, future started, and I uh, did not accept it, and uh, I got out of, I was, got a separation of service. Uh, as an officer, I did not uh, get uh, a discharge, I signed up for the reserve, because I said, I'm young enough, if another war breaks out in the next five years, they're going to call me back anyway, and I might just as well come back with longevity and uh, in rank and so on. And I was right. Within five years, Korea broke out, and I was called back for Korea. And, uh, and I was called back in as a captain. Again, I was being assigned to a, a squadron in uh, Detroit, which would have called for a major. And, but unfortunately for the Army, uh, when I was being processed, they said, married? I said, yes. They said, dependents? I said, yes. They said, how many? I said, four. They said, well, we're sorry. We don't take anybody back with four dependents unless they volunteer. Are you volunteering? I said, no. They said, well, we're sorry. We can't keep you. And then I got a second. Uh, well. Hold just a moment. We need to so you didn't uh, get into Korea? No. So I was only on active duty for one week while they processed me. And at the end of the week, I went back into the reserve, and I was in the reserve for the entire time of the Korean War, so that if they needed me, they would have brought me back in. Uh, they did bring back all of my uh, lieutenants and what have you back into the service, and they all ended up to see the full colonels, the lieutenant colonels, and I got back in and served in Korea. I probably would have ended up as a colonel as well. Uh, now, you met Chenault a few times. Yes. What were your impressions of him as it, a man? As I said, I had all the respect in the world for this man. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, a, to my mind, a great, uh, well, first of all, uh, he was a great tactician. Coming up with this uh, uh, no dog fighting, this was, uh, no other general of any other Air Force came up with that idea. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Japanese were successful against our planes in every other area. They were not successful because of Chennault's tactics. But he was also a great individual. He would get out there we'd, in our spare time, the men would be playing baseball. He had to play every time. Uh, he all, but he only had to pitch. He was the commanding general. He says, I want to pitch. He pitched. <laughs> and so he was always the pitcher. Uh, but he was out there with the men all the time. He. Uh, uh, 
did not, uh, he was not overbearing as some generals uh, were, mm -hmm. or uh, I shouldn't make comments about other generals, but my personal general, I was assigned to the 312th uh, fighter wing. Our commanding general was General Randall, and he was based, as I told said, back in uh, Chengtu. In the entire year and a half that I was up in Xi'an, he never once came up to see my operation but to see us up there. We were too close to the Japanese. And uh, he never did come up. When uh, the theater com commander changed, when General Wedemeyer uh, came in as theater commander, uh, first thing he did was to come up to Xi'an. He came up, uh, he wasn't afraid to be near the Japanese. Well, we weren't, didn't have too many Japanese near us at that time, but he came up. And my idea of him as a general was that he was uh, the complete politician. I shouldn't say this. General Wedemeyer, I think, is still alive. And I wouldn't want to get back to him that I, I'm making these comments about him. But he can, gets off the plane, and he came over down at my operation, and he's a three-star general, and he comes up, and he says, call me Al. He sticks out his hand, shakes hands with me, and he says, I'm a captain. He's three stars. Call me Al. Now, <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can visualize me calling uh, General Wedemeyer, hello, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but he, but, but my uh, General, General Randall, he, he named us Randall's Raiders. And all the publicity that went back, and I got, got articles from Newsweek and what have you that my w wife would send me, Randall's Raiders did this in China. And he never came near us, but we were Randall's Raiders uh, shooting down the Japanese planes. Uh, what did uh, what did you do in off time recreation? What did I do for myself? Uh, I'm an antique uh, collector of Chinese antiques, and I visited every antique uh, dealer in the area in my time off, uh, buying Chinese an antiques. I uh, I have quite a collection at home of ivories and jades and porcelains and what have you. My enlisted men. They went into the nearest bars, and uh, that's how they spent their time. Uh, we played volleyball on the field, and uh, they, uh, they sat around, and we read, and what have you. But uh, there wasn't too much in the way on the field for uh, activities. Mm -hmm. We did have one USO group come up to, uh, there, and that surprised me. Uh, Jinx Falkenberg and... Uh, Ben Blue, and, uh, they came up, and uh, Pat O'Brien, and uh, to this day, I support the USO. Nobody else came up. The Salvation Army never came up to there. We never got donuts and coffee from the Salvation Army or any of these other uh, groups. But the USO did come up there, and so I have all the regards in the world for them. And to this day, when I get my little envelopes in the mail requesting funds, I support the USO. I send them a check. How big a base was it? How big a base? Very small. Uh, he had the uh, bombed out uh, hangar and the planes lined up on the field. We had uh, 16 P-51s lined up out there and we had uh, uh, two P-47s and then later became uh, two uh, P-61s. Very small base. Uh, they all lived in, as I mentioned, the this convent uh, thing. They were all housed there. There was, uh, it wasn't, uh, there was, it wasn't a convent. Not at this point. They had all left, but it was uh, had been a convent, and they lived there. Very small base. Uh, we were outside of the town. To get into town, we uh, had rickshaws lined up at the uh, out. Uh, the field was uh, surrounded by a tank moat uh, trench and a little hill, and uh, and we had at the outside of this, the gate to it, there were rickshaws, and to go into town, we'd hire a rickshaw to pull us into town. About how many um, observer posts did you have, did you deal with? Uh, those, the, oh, those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, all over the entire north half of China. Uh, we were responsible for the north half of China, uh, there was another squadron uh, down for the middle section, and there was another squadron down 
for the uh, southern half, southern third of uh, China. So uh, I had posts all over, hundreds and hundreds of them, and they were all very thorough. I will tell you a, a story. Uh, to the south of uh, our field, there was a little mountain, a little mountain range, and we had posts there, but I did not get calls uh, from this, uh, uh, these posts there. And so I reported this to the Chinese uh, general, and I said, I'm not getting any calls from these posts there. Can you do something to uh, get them on the ball? And in a very calm voice, just as I'm talking to you, he said, give me the numbers of those posts, and I'll have all the people at them beheaded. You can visualize, uh, I could not give him the numbers of any posts. I was not going to be responsible for any uh, people being beheaded. So I never did get calls from the south of us. And how fate works. If, uh, if I wasn't religious before going there, I certainly became religious after this, this one incident that I'm going to relate. Uh, I get calls, planes are taking off, they're heading south of us. And so I'm sitting there looking at my map and I'm plotting these calls and I say, uh-oh, uh, so-and-so is going to get hit, hit tonight, they're going to get it, and I'm sitting there uh, thinking we're not, we're not going to get hit at all. Now when our field was uh, under attack, above my uh, bomb shelter where I lived, I had a little revetted area, sandbags, and in it I had a uh, transmitter uh, that I could speak to the planes. And I would send up our planes and visually control our planes, uh, giving the altitude that I saw the Japanese planes were. Because if the Japanese planes were coming in at one altitude, I'd had to know where to send our planes, because if they were at a different altitude, they couldn't see the Japanese planes. So I would always visually control up on top when our field was the target. On this one night, and I'm sitting there watching the planes going south of us, one flight of planes veered off coming north over this area that I do not get calls from. I did not know that we were going to get hit. This flight came over our field. Our field got bombed. My operation got bombed. My antennas were knocked down. I was put off the air. And in the morning when I came up in this little revetted area that I, uh, where I stood, there had been a direct bomb hit right into that I dug the shrapnel out of the sandbags. I have it home, I kept it, and uh, I have the shrapnel as a souvenir of what might have been in me had I been standing there, and I would have been standing there had I known the planes were coming up. But because I did not have these people beheaded south of me, and I did not uh, get these people replaced with efficient people, uh, I, I was saved. Now. Is that fate or what? If I wasn't, as I say, religious before, I said, the good Lord is taking care of me. I'm right in his hand. He's watching over me. And whether this whole thing he planned to see what type of a person I was. And, uh, well, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, somehow I felt that the good Lord took care of me by uh, not having me up there that night. Did... Uh you experience any of the internal politics of China? Or uh, internal politics? No, I was. I met with the Chinese general. He was the Chinese general. He was the governor of the province. He was the warlord, whatever name you want to give him. But he was life and death over this. As a matter of fact, all of the uh, Chinese commanders had life and death control over their people. As I said, we had Chinese guards around our uh, my area. My enlisted men were complaining that uh, things were missing in, from the tents. I said, how can that be? You've got a Chinese guard walking around there. How can things be missing? One afternoon, one of my enlisted men uh, had an upset stomach, and he didn't go to m m mess. He was laying in his cot. And he's laying in there, and he sees a hand sneaking in through the corner between the tent flaps, <coughs> reaching into a barracks bag and pulling out a carton of cigarettes. He gets out of bed and runs out. It's the Chinese guard who, who is stealing. So I reported this to the uh, uh, commanding officer of the Chinese company and protocol. He invites me to have company punishment for this man, and I want you there as a 
commanding officer of this unit, to observe. So I went over there visualizing company punishment as we would have it, man walking back and forth with a 60-pound pack on his bag, on his back, walking back and forth. Instead, in the middle of the parade grounds, there was a bronze post, uh, the diameter of a telegraph pole. This man is standing in front of the pole with his arms strapped behind the pole. The company of uh, the Chinese enlisted men line up. They were having these big padded jackets that they wore in the, in the winter time with a big leather belt with a big brass buckle. The 200 men in the company line up, take off the belts, wrap them around their fists with the brass buckle hanging there. They line up, the first man goes up right across the face of this man tied to the pole. Second man comes up, across the face with the buckle. After the fifth man walked up, I thanked the Chinese uh, commanding officer, and I left. I wasn't going to watch this face being uh, turned into chop meat. And that's what would have, that's life and death in the, the, the Chinese. No, no uh, man isn't doing his job or commits a crime, dead. And uh, other than that, I got along fine with, <laughs> uh, with the Chinese. Uh, they, uh, their big anniversary, their big day, what they call the double 10, October 10th, XX, double 10. And they would have a party, a big celebration, uh, chamber music. Uh, I was invited all to this celebration with my uh, top enlisted people. We would sit there and they'd be playing with Chinese instruments and some uh, other instruments, uh, the uh, classics. Uh, serve a nice meal and uh, uh, very, very friendly. Did uh, you were a Jewish boy from Brooklyn? Right. Any discrimination? No discrimination at all. As a matter of fact, the uh, on the Jewish holidays of uh, Yom Kippur, uh, all Jewish personnel were that wanted to attend services were invited back to another base uh, for services. They were brought in from every direction for services. I went along and I'm there and uh, they look at me and they said, you're the ranking officer here. Uh, you're in charge of the services. Uh, frankly, I was not that knowledgeable of our Jewish, uh, con conducting Jewish service, but fortunately some of my enlisted men were, and we put on a Jew, but they did, for all the Jewish personnel, they brought them in to, for their services. We were off duty during the holidays, and uh, uh, no, there was no discrimination at all there. Uh, when you say discrimination, there was no blacks uh, over there either. At that time, in 1943, uh, the blacks were not integrated with us. No blacks in our outfit at all. It wasn't until Harry Truman came in as president that he integrated the army. Uh, the blacks were always uh, had a separate unit elsewhere. They were never, in, even in this country, they were not on the same base with us. I mentioned Camp Wheeler. Uh, we had all of our companies on, in Camp Wheeler. Uh, the black company was outside the field. They weren't on the field and they were brought in uh, in the winter time to clean out the ashes in the potbelly stoves that we had in the barracks and to take out the garbage. That's what they used the black company for. It, uh, coming from Brooklyn where uh, I went to Brooklyn College and half the students at Brooklyn College were black or so. Uh, this never set right with me. I just couldn't uh, go along with that. But you were discharged when? Uh, actually, I have never been well, discharged, separated, separated from service uh, at the end of the Korean War. Now, I had two separations of service. One in 1946, when I came back from China, uh, I was on terminal leave until February 46 because I had never gotten a leave while I was in China, so I had accumulated that much leave time. So I was on leave in uniform until February 1946. Uh, where were you when uh, the bomb was dropped? Was uh, in China? No, when the bomb was dropped? Yes, yes, of course I was in China. 
and after the prior to the bomb dropping, between that period and the end of the war in Europe, uh, we were packing up ready to, uh, for the invasion of Japan. Uh, we were packing up, getting ready for the invasion, and we were figuring that was going to cost us a million casualties because the Japanese were not going to surrender. They were going to go up to the mountains and we were going to go cave by cave uh, with flamethrowers or something, trying to get them out of their caves. They were never going to surrender. And we visualized we'd be bombing all of the Japanese uh, cities that manufactured military goods. There would be more Japanese civilians lost than were lost in the two bombs. And yet people say, how could we have been so uh, vicious, so savage to drop these bombs and kill all these civilians? If those bombs hadn't been dropped and we had to bomb all of Japan, many more civilians would have been uh, killed than were killed in just those two bombs. Mm -hmm. And as I say, there would have been a million uh, casualties uh, in the invasion. No, when that bomb was dropped, we all heaved such a sigh of relief that, uh, and the war ended. Uh, it, uh, you, um, you have any general thoughts about your military career? Any thoughts about it? Other people uh, have complained about the time in service. I enjoyed my period of time. I was away from my family, which uh, certainly was, uh, was an unhappy uh, period for me. But I, I have the ability to enjoy. I enjoyed the country over there. I enjoyed meeting the people. As you asked me what I did with my time off, I'd go into town to these uh, antique stores, and I went so frequently that I became friendly, friends, I should say, with all of the Chinese uh, civilians, the owners of the stores, their families. I met them. Uh, I they would invite me to have dinner with them. I would uh, have dinner if it was during business hours. So in their stores, they would have two tables, one big table, all the men sat around it, a smaller table in the corner where the women sat around. The women did not sit with the men at the same table. We would sit there, there'd be a big lazy Susan in the center of the table, you'd spin it around, all the 18 courses would be on these lazy Susans, you'd help yourself to what you wanted, uh, you'd pass those you didn't want, and I became very good friends with a lot of them. They invited me to restaurants, when we went to a restaurant, the family, the women never came, but they hired women to sit at the table just to pour drinks for us, and to make conversation, to light a cigarette if you smoke, and just to have female companionship there, uh, just during the meal. It was, there was nothing uh, sexual or anything about it, but they would have hired women to it. Uh, but I went to restaurants with them. And the, I became such good friends that towards the, I'd been there about a year or so, and they decided to surprise me, one of the families, with an American-style meal. And all this time, I had been eating with chopsticks. And the little children would laugh at me the way I uh, uh, couldn't maneuver the chopsticks the way they did. For this meal, they had manufactured knives, forks, and spoons. They were flat. The, the uh, fork was perfectly flat. And at the, the table, the little children were trying to eat with a fork. And I laughed at I, It was time for me to laugh at them. They couldn't pick up any food on the forks. But this Chinese, this American meal, somewhere they had dug up a hand crank ice cream maker. The first course, it's an American uh, meal. Ice cream. That was the first course. And the whole meal ran backwards. Uh, they had steak. Where they got steak, they didn't have cattle there, but they had water buffaloes out in the fields. And these water buffaloes, uh, they didn't kill them until they dropped dead from old age. And then <laughs> the steak was like shoe leather. It was so tough. And trying to cut it with these man-made uh, knives and forks, uh, or something, but I was so thrilled that they thought that much on me to put on American style dinner for me on this occasion. But the Chinese, as I say, went out of their way to be nice to the Americans. And I wondered after the war, how could they have uh, come over to communism the way they did? Something that you have to realize, uh, Chiang Kai-shek Mozi Tung, Enlai, 
all were communists to begin with. They were all trained in Russia in the 1918, uh, the beginning, uh, when Sun Yat-sen was there, and they were all trained as communists. And uh, these, these were all companions at that time. But when Sun Yat-sen died and Chiang Kai-shek uh, took over, he immediately turned on all of his uh, communist buddies and uh, the nationalist government was formed. Uh, but he was a socialist to begin with. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think uh, why the, they switched. During the war, Chiang Kai-shek was fighting the Japanese, losing his best soldiers, best armies. The communists were getting stronger and stronger. Up uh, the, uh, if you can visualize the area where I am, it was Yellow River, was like a Y. And the Japanese were in the Y in the uh, part. The communists were on the other side, north of the river, and we were south of the river. And the communists up at Yinan, with headquarters at Yinan, were getting stronger by the day. And not, uh, they had signed a pact with Chiang Kai-shek that they would not in, invade China invade, while the Japanese were on their soil. So they didn't. They stayed neutral. But they grew stronger. Uh, something that is not known, and the, the American government has never admitted, we paid the communists in gold for any of our pilots that managed to get over <laughs> the Y into their territory and, and crash and come down. Any pilots that the communists returned to us, we paid in gold for their return. But the, we had at our field a one officer whose only job was to sit at a radio in contact with Yinan. 24 hours a day, his radio was in contact with Yinan, and if any of our pilots were downed and where they uh, were picked up by the communists, he was in contact, made the arrangements uh, for the transfer of gold and the return of the pilot. Mm -hmm. Now, our government has denied ever having any relations with the communists. I know for a fact that this is not so because I knew the uh, officer in charge. Uh, his name was Sam Steele, and we became buddies. And after the war, I got corresponded with him uh, until he died a few years ago. I still correspond with his widow. Uh, but he was in contact, and so I know this for a fact that we uh, did contact them. But. Uh, did you uh, ever think about going back? Into service? No, oh, back to China. China. Yes, I have been back. Oh, you have? Uh, we have a 14th Air Force reunion every year. I go maybe every five years. I don't go to all of the reunions. Uh, and in 1981, I think it was. 1981? Now I lose track of uh, years. Uh, the Chinese come over here every year to our reunions. So one year we decided we would have our reunion with the Chinese uh, over there. And uh, I went with the group that went back uh, for our reunion with the Chinese over there. And again, they couldn't do enough for us. We were there one week, and every night some uh, group hosted us with a banquet and entertainment. And each night the group uh, tried to outdo the uh, previous night's banquet and with entertainment. One night the Chinese airline was our host, one night the Bank of China was our host, and the final night the Chinese Air Force was our host. No, the final night we hosted them, but the uh, penultimate night uh, we were hosted by the Chinese Air Force, and uh, each one of us got ties with the, Chinese, with the Chinese pilot's wings on them. The women got scarves with Chinese pilot's wings. I still wear the tie on occasion and they uh, couldn't do enough for us. And uh, I met some of the Chinese, who were by this time generals in the Chinese Air Force. I met them at uh, reunions here. I met the same ones at our table. At every table over there, they had a Chinese officer mm -hmm. as our host, uh, table host. And so I uh, remember meeting the general who was at our table, having met him in this country, uh, five years earlier or so. So yes, I've been back and again, they couldn't do enough for us over there. So overall, there's a, 
was a good experience for you. Uh, well, as I say, it was a learning experience for me. I certainly learned more about China than I could have ever learned from books. Sure. And uh, I learned that the Chinese, China is so vast. When you talk of China, it isn't just one people. It's many. In the south, uh, they speak a different language than they do up north. They speak Cantonese in the south. They speak Mandarin Chinese in the north. The Chinese uh, in the south are darker. You find some black-skinned Chinese in the South, and as a group, of course there are exceptions, that they were shorter. In the North, in the colder regions, they were taller, and they were fairer-skinned. In the South, they were shorter and dar uh, darker-skinned. Different languages, spoken languages. The written language is uh, the same. Uh, one of the people that went with me back to China uh, when we, where we were, he couldn't converse with the people, but he would write it out. He could write Chinese, and he would write out, and they could read what he wanted, uh, because the written language was the same. But the uh, Cantonese language is different than the Mandarin Chinese. And, uh, and the country is so vast, as I say, it's a tropical region in the south, it's a temperate region in the north, you go can, uh, still further up, uh, you get almost to a frigid region if you go far enough north. And uh, entirely, uh, the, the people were not the same, the language was not the same, the customs were not the same. So, but we speak of China as being one uh, country. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Lasker. That was, uh, that was excellent. I appreciate it. Well, I was very happy to get this on record. As I say, some of the things that we did uh, will never be known. The things that the Chinese re, uh, reunion in over there, there was a young honeymoon couple there from the United States. We were in the Grand Hotel. We were all wearing caps. With the, well, they gave us red caps with a flying tiger on the front of it. And the young bride comes over to me and says, I see all you men here with these caps with that funny insignia. What is that? I said, that's a flying tiger. We were over here during World War II fighting uh, with the Chinese against the Japanese. She looked at me and said, we were over here during World War II? And then she floored me with her next question. She said, did we win? <laughs> Thinking of Vietnam, possibly. Yeah. Uh. Uh.